discipleship on the last two um, sessions, mainly because I really feel we need to hear Andy's rhyme again, if you, anybody can remember. But Andy kicked us off and he talked about discipleship being like an apprenticeship. And he came up with a rhyme about Jesus. And um, can anybody remember it without Andy helping us? No, very close, very close. He, yeah, yeah, Jesus drew us. Drew us. He knew us. He shoo us. <laughs> he grew us, and then he flew us. This was Andy, so okay. <laughs> um, so I've changed it slightly, actually, Andy, and so did Mark last week. His um, his new went to seeing, and last week um, Mark talked about how we see Jesus, how we need to see Jesus, but also how he sees us, he knows us. And this week, we're going to do the growing. And I've actually added a little bit about growing in relationship, because discipleship works best in relationship. So I'm going to start off, I'm being very brave this morning, by throwing out another question to you, um, which is, what is the best gift that you can give in a relationship? What do you think? Love. Love? Service. Time. Service. Time. Thank you. I thought I'd give them three guesses. She got it on three. Well done. Time, I would say time and attention. And my friend Nikki Gumball apparently agrees with me because I found that online. Uh, but time and attention. Now, I'm a middle child of three, and I don't know whether you know that, but middle children tend to need or crave a little bit of more time and attention because they don't feel like they get it. And so I've got one the elder sister, one younger sister. Um, I had a lot of love and attention for my mum. She was a stay-at-home mum. But my dad was a very hard-working father. You know, he was the breadwinner. He was never there. Um, but he had a passion, and his passion happened to be football, okay, but the Arsenal Football Club, I couldn't say anything while Lucas was in here, oh dear, the Arsenal Football Club, which is where he was brought up. And I twigged when I was about 10, that if I pretended to like football, and I actually nagged my dad a bit and pursued him a bit, I might get taken along to the football matches. So that's actually what I did. So it would be about once a month, every six weeks. I would go with my dad on the train to London, um, and then we would walk on the high pavement to Arsenal football matches. Now, I'm talking about 50 years ago, okay, more than 50 years ago. But, you know, I still remember those times with my dad as being such special times. And what we did was we talked together on the train, I probably asked him lots of questions, you know, drove him a little bit crazy. And then when we, when we got there, we went to Manzi's, which was a pie and mash shop in Chapel Street. It had sawdust on the, on the floor. Best pie and mash you could ever get. So we ate together. And then as we walked along, it was a bit boring, it was a long walk. We played a game together. We had fun together. And I took his arm and he took mine. And we tried to get out of step with one another. You know, you walked along. And then finally, he pretended he hurt his hip and he couldn't do it anymore. And we laughed. And then during the match, we would still chat. And he actually shared his passion of football with me. Until in the end, I got quite passionate about football too. But we were actually, my dad didn't really realise it, but my dad was kind of mentoring me and discipling me while we were doing this thing together. We were doing a part of life together. We were walking together. We were talking together. We were having fun together. And I was learning, you know, of some of his values and things I carry with me today because of those football matches and my time with him. It was a very special time for me. You might not remember anything else today, but if you remember that, you would hopefully remember some of the things that I'm trying to say today that I'm going to bring out. So, we're going to talk about Peter and Jesus as we did. Look at it from the side of a disciple and somebody who is discipling. And um, this is the kind of uh, format that we've got at the moment. So, last time, I'm not actually going to be reading a specific passage today. I'm going to be picking and choosing lots of um, 
illustrations, I suppose, from scripture. So this is Bible-based, but I am going to be flitting around a bit, so I hope you'll um, understand why I'm doing that when I'm trying to talk about the faith. <laughs> but last time, Mark spoke um, from Luke about the first time that Jesus and, um, came across the disciples, the fishermen, Peter, and he told them to cast their nets <coughs> on the other side of the boat, and miraculously, against all the odds, they took in this great load of fish. And then we had these words, go away from me, from Peter, I'm a sinful man. And Mark said, quite rightly, it's because he touched something of the holiness of Jesus at that time. But I'm also going to suggest it's because he didn't really know Jesus at that time either. That he was actually, don't come near me, Jesus. He didn't know the love and acceptance that Jesus could offer him. But later on, we see now things have got quite tricky for the followers of Jesus, and some of the disciples are actually going away, they're actually leaving. And Jesus gives Peter that option. Okay, this is further along their journey together. And Peter responds, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life, and we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. Something has happened here in their relationship. There's definitely there's this belief. Peter now has this belief, this trust in Jesus. And even though things aren't going really well, he's not prepared to leave him. Then he knows he is the Holy One of God. There's nobody else like him, nobody else to go to. And in the same way, Jesus later says to his disciples, I no longer call you servants, because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything I've learned from my Father, I have made known to you. And that speaks of the relationship from Jesus' point of view, that here's Jesus, they share business together. There's been a trust and intimacy between them, that not only does, um, Jesus, does Peter know Jesus, but Jesus, Peter knows Jesus' business as well. And everything I've learned from my Father, I have made known to you. So there's a growth in this relationship that we can see. And my question is, well, how? And I'm just going to speak on two things today. Two A's. Don't come up with a rhyme, but lots of alliteration today. Two A's. One of them is availability, and the other one is attitude. And I don't know why I keep looking up there, because I've got my notes down here, but there you go. So we're going to start with Peter. So availability, three P's. Peter prioritised, okay, the discipleship with Jesus, his walk with Jesus. In that same passage in Luke, they pulled their boats up on the shore. He left everything and followed him. There is evidence that later on he still did fish. He needed to earn a living. He probably got hungry. But from the moment that he met Jesus, he made a decision to follow him and his priorities changed. His priority now was to be with Jesus, to learn from him, and the whole direction of his life had changed. He became intentional with his time. He was intentional that he was now going to make Jesus his priority. You know, I've done that several times in my walk with Jesus. You know, God, I'm going to follow you first. When I started my caring job, I was asked, what's your availability? And I said, oh, I can't do Sundays. I can't do Sunday this time because I've got church. I can't do Tuesday nights because that's when we meet together. You know what happens? Over time, we kind of lose that priority. They said, oh, yeah, but, you know, could you not visit this person? It'd be really good. And you begin to actually sometimes exchange your priorities for good things or seemingly good things, and then you find Jesus is getting crowded out. He's dropping down that priority list. It's not something we intend to do, but it's something that happens. And it's like we have to come again and actually look at what are my priorities. I truly believe that what we really love or care for, what's important to us, we will make our first priority. Okay? that we will make time for it. We will be available. You know, I'm speaking to myself here as well as anybody else. So Jesus' 
he gave Jesus first priority in his life. And don't feel that, you know, it's not like making a New Year's resolution. I'm going to do this, I'm going to put Jesus first. And then five weeks later, God, Je God Jesus can help us in this. He can change us, change our priorities. When I first became a Christian, I loved secular music. It took up a lot of my time. And I felt Jesus, I prayed to God, I don't think this is really what you want. And my heart changed. I didn't want to listen to it anymore. God can help us. God can help us change our priorities. Peter also, oh sorry, go back on one. Peter actually pursued Jesus. We see him present in many significant events when Jesus healed Jairus' daughter, when he fed the 5,000, when Jesus was arrested at the Transfiguration. He was a follower in every sense of the word. You know, where Jesus was, Peter was. He pursued him. I pursued my dad a bit so I could be with him. But he pursued Jesus. A little, little bit like Mary and her little lamb, everywhere that Mary went, the lamb was, everywhere that Jesus went, you would find Peter. He wanted to be with Jesus and he took every opportunity to do so, whatever the cost. Sometimes there is a cost. Peter had a family. You know, Peter would have had to still earn a living of some kind. But Peter chose to pursue Jesus, whatever the cost. Peter was present too. What I mean by that, he didn't just give his time, but he gave his full attention. When he was with Jesus, he wasn't just there, he wasn't a, the person in the seat. He was focusing on Jesus. One of my pet paints is actually, when you're talking to somebody, and they're looking over your shoulder, or towards someone else, or even at the clock, and you feel, they're not really listening to me. They don't really care about me, thank you Jane. They don't really care what I'm saying, you know? We can, I thought that's a pet hate, actually, but then I thought, actually, how many times do I go and have my quiet time? And I'm thinking, right, okay, read this bit, and do that, yep, yeah, great, off me my day then, you know. We can do it to Jesus too. We cannot give our full time and attention. So in Matthew 15, we see Jesus called the crowds to him and said, listen and understand. He said, what goes in someone's mouth does not defile them, but what comes out of their mouth does. Peter then said, explain that to me. He was listening. He wanted to gain understanding. And in Matthew 16 too, where Jesus came to the region of Caesarea, Philippi, he asked the disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? And they gave various answers. And then he pressed Jesus a bit and said, what about you? Who do you say I am? And Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And that speaks to me of that when Peter was there seeking, that actually he was engaged. He was engaged. He was listening for what God was saying. He was engaged with the Holy Spirit. He was present. And if we want to grow as disciples, we need to be present. Not just a bottom on the seat. I think we had a, a thingy once about um, not being passengers, but being crew on a ship. We need to be engaged. And it was from that that Jesus actually said, I tell you that Peter, you will be the rock I will build my church upon for that engagement. So just looking at Jesus now and his availability, the first thing was Jesus. So as a disciple, somebody who disciples, Jesus actually loved people and wanted to be with them. His, his, he had a mission, which was to reunite all people with their Heavenly Father. And to do that, he had to make himself available to them. And there was a willingness there and a wanting to be with people. And you see him time after time. Sometimes he's with a crowd, sometimes he's with an individual, sometimes he's with a group of disciples. 
Some, and there are a whole variety of people from different walks of society. We have the tax collectors, the prostitutes, but also um, we have the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. And Jesus is available to them all. There's an incident in Matthew 14 when Jesus has just had some bad news. He's had some news that John the Baptist has been beheaded. And he's tired. And the only thing he wants to do is withdraw to a solitary place. But then he sees a large crowd. And because he wants to be there for them, he has compassion on them. And he goes and heals the sick. As somebody who disciples, you have to have a heart for the people. And you know what? They may not always want you at the most convenient time for you. You might get a phone call, a text message, a prayer request, and knock on the door, which is not a convenient time for you. And it's only having that heart for people that's going to allow you to actually respond to that. You might not be feeling great yourself, but you need to be available. You do need times to withdraw, withdrew, withdrew, withdraw yourself and get your food, but there's also this need to be with other people. So one of the things that Jesus did with his availability was he walked with his disciples. He basically did life with them. He ate with them, he talked with them, he taught them about many things, the kingdom of God, its nature, its value, grace, forgiveness, prayer, justice, the list just goes on. And as he was with them, and talking with them, and teaching them, he also modelled what he taught. So, they saw forgiveness for those who sought to hurt him or persecute him. They saw him staying silent, not trying to justify his actions when accused. They saw him staying strong through difficulties. They saw he was committed to his purpose. He stayed loving. It was sort of being together and doing things together that the discipleship was actually at its best and most effective because they were seeing it, you know, not just the talk, but they were seeing the walk, it being walked out in practice. If we want to disciple others, then we need to be prepared to walk with them and do life with them as well. Jesus needed to withdraw quite rightly at times to be alone with his father but he also withdrew to have time with his close disciples in mark 9 30 to 31 he said don't even tell anybody where we're going because he wanted to explain something quite difficult to with them he wanted to invest in them so that they understood and that investment in the few was to so that they could then go and bear fruit with the many and there are times when we need that one-to-one -one with Jesus or in a personal pastoring relationship. We need times of deeper sharing and challenge. And that's modelled by Jesus here. We see his availability is that he could withdraw, that he could provide those times for people. So that's availability. The second point is about attitude. Okay, so gone for three A's here now for Peter. Peter was active and not passive. We see him pressing in, taking the initiative, not waiting for things to happen, hoping it might happen. I'll just grow if I sit here, but actually making it happen. In, in the beginning of John, the disciples asked, where are you staying, Jesus? And the, Jesus' response was, come and you will see. If we're active in reaching out to Jesus, we can guarantee there's going to be a response from him that will be a welcome. Come, come with me. He promises not to turn anyone away who's looking for him. We know the verse about asking and finding and seeking. The second thing that Peter did was ask questions. 
I don't think Victoria was here today, she'd bear me out. But children between 0 and 5 learn more at any other time, than between that period, than any other time in their life. And how do they do that? They do it by asking questions incessantly. I had a bit of an, I did think about whether I should share this, but I did have, I had to laugh at this this week. I was with my three-year-old granddaughter, just turned three, and um, we were in a soft play area, and there was a brand new baby there. That the, a mum went and got out the pram. And my three, my three-year-old granddaughter said to me, "Did that baby come from that lady's tummy?" And I said, "Yes, it did. That's when she knew that much. It knew that come." Anyway, the lady sat down and she started. She rested the baby on her tummy and started breastfeeding the baby with my three-year-old granddaughter watching. And she was, she was, she's in heaven seen. She's been bottle-fed, didn't know about breastfeeding, and she's kind of watching intently. And she said, "Why is that lady got that baby on her tummy?" And so I said to her, well, the lady's feeding her milk. She's, it's what we call breastfeeding. And she looked at me and she said, but Nana, milk comes from cows. <laughs> 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 and I thought, I can't argue with that either. So she's still got some learning to do. But she's asking. She was asking questions. And there's so many examples um, in God's word of Peter and the disciples doing the same. So, um, when Pe then Peter came to Jesus, this is in Matthew 18, and he said, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times. And of course, Jesus said 70 times seven. And then again, in Luke 12, he said, but understanding this, if the owner of the house had known what hour the thief was coming, so this is Jesus' teaching, he would not have let his house be broken into. You also must be ready, because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. Peter asked, Lord, are you telling this parable to us, or to everybody? My children, this is in John 13, I will be with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and just as I told the Jews, so I tell you now, where I am going, you cannot come. But Simon Peter asked, but Lord, where are you going? Peter is trying to understand what Jesus is saying. He's trying to get the knowledge to go from his head to down to his heart. It's like we, there is that sort of adage when you give a man, do you give a man a fish or do you give him a tool to fish? And teaching today doesn't provide all the answers, but it promotes an inquiring mind so that actually children can learn for themselves. Peter wasn't just after information. He was after understanding so he would be transformed. And that's what discipleship is about. It's about transformation, not just information. He needed that knowledge to go from his head to his heart. And that's why he continued to ask questions. There's nothing wrong with asking questions. God, I don't understand. You can ask them of people, you can ask them of God. Teach me, show me. He will answer you if you ask him. Peter also acted on what he'd learned and seen. And a good example of this is Matthew 14, the walking on the water. Peter has just seen Jesus walk on the water. And he says to him, Lord, if you tell me to come to you on that water, then I'll come. And, and Jesus responds by saying, come, one word, come. So Peter gets out to the boat and he walks on the water. We know there's a moment when he takes his eyes off Jesus and he's about to sink. But he reaches the other side when he reaches out to Jesus again and takes his hand. And that passage is evidence of transformation in Peter. Peter is acting on what Jesus has said. But we also see a man here that is dependent on Jesus. Previously, when Peter first met Jesus, he was a very independent fisherman. He relied on his own skills, kind of lived a very ordinary life. Here he is, 
knowing Christ in a different way. He's dependent on Christ and he's doing the extraordinary. And that's the transformation that God looks for us in us. And after Jesus has gone to heaven on the day of Pentecost, there is Peter preaching to 3,000, well, more than 3,000. There's 3,000 conversions. I wonder if when he left his boat on that first day, did he ever envisage he was going to be there mm. preaching to 3,000, seeing 3,000 um, conversions. There is a transformation in that man. It wasn't all hunky-dory. You know, there's been moments in Peter's life, if you look at the Gospels, there's been moments when he has doubted. We know about his denial as well, which I think we're going to talk about another day. So I'm not making out if the trajectory was kind of like straight up. There's, you know, there's bumps in the road. There's bumps in all of our roads. But Peter, because of his attitude, saw a transformation in his life. Lastly, I just want to talk about Jesus' attitude as someone who disciples. Got three H's. I nearly gave up on this one. I nearly couldn't find three of anything. I was getting a bit tired by that time, but then I found three H's. Okay. So the first is, if we are discipling on, what is our attitude to the people that we are discipling? Jesus came as a servant king. And we see that in the discipling, as we do in other things. He doesn't come to lord it over people, but he comes to seek to serve, to encourage growth with humility. In some of the passages, in John 13 and other passages you will read, it's not you will do this, it's, but if you do this, you will see the good, you will see the benefit. This is Jesus. If you love one another, everyone will know you are my disciples. There's always an invitation, but it's not a dictation. He's not a dictator, and nor should we be with people that, you know, you will do this, or you should do this. It should be, if you do this. Jesus came with a humility. He came to serve people. In the same way, he honoured those who wanted to learn and grow. And he actually respected those who didn't. There was a respect. He told his own disciples, if anyone doesn't welcome you or listen to you, shake the dust off. Which is the same hand as basically is wash, wash your hands of them, really. That there was a point. You know, if these people, if there's people that are not going to welcome me, not going to want to grow, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make it drink. It's like, move on, move on. And Jesus doesn't force feed us, but what he does do is lay a banquet before us. He lays a banquet of food before us, but he doesn't fit, um, force feed us. And I think the reason behind that is, is we do not have the responsibility. If somebody, if you are discipling someone, you are not responsible for their personal walk with Jesus. Only they are responsible for that walk. They have freedom of choice and action. You know, our walk is with Jesus alone. And one of the things that's come up for me in the past as well is I want to fix people. You know, I don't like to see people hurting. I don't like to see people struggling. I want to fix it. I want to make it better. But when we're discipling somebody, we're not there to fix them. That's not our job. Our job is to encourage them, is to show them when they can get answers, to walk with them through whatever they're walking through. But it isn't to fix them. That's not what our job is. And I think there's a real danger, and I think some people have suffered from that in the past, where people have tried to fix them. And I'm aware of that, because I do feel I'm a bit of a fixer, really. I want it all to be lovely for them. And I can't do it. It's not my role. The last thing in Jesus' attitude as a disciple is about his honesty with them. His disciples saw him in exhilarating moments 
but they also saw him at his lowest ebb as well. On the mountaintop and in the valley. And there's three occasions in the Bible where it's said that Jesus actually shed tears. And two of them were in front of his disciples. One of them was at Lazarus' tomb. And it says Jesus wept. Because Jesus was fully human as well as fully God. We know he was perfect, but he actually did identify and could feel, you know, when people are mourning, when people are sad. And he wasn't afraid to show his disciples this. There was something in him doing that that validated the feelings of those around him. It's okay to feel sad. It's okay to feel as you feel. And actually, I feel that too. And when we're discipling people, there is something about making ourselves vulnerable. It's okay not to have it all put together or to share with them Actually, yeah, I face that difficulty too. We can open up to them. I respect people who do that. I respect leaders that say, haven't got it all together, you know. I still struggle with stuff as well. We're all still learning. We're just we're not just there. We're learning for as long as we're on this earth. And it's okay for them to open up, and it's okay to be honest. And Jesus was honest with his disciples. There was a little warning here. Um, that's why we don't have mixed gender sort of personal pastoring, because if you are being vulnerable and open with people, it could lead to inappropriate relationships and dependence on one another. So that's why we don't, as a church, advocate that. But we do advocate being honest as we're discipling others, because Jesus was real, and we need to be real too. We're not just people who've got it all together. I just felt today that, um, you know, we need challenge sometimes in discipleship, but I don't want this to come across as condemnation in any sense or form, because I've been doing this this week, and you know, I've been really challenged about my walk with God. It always happens when you speak on something, isn't it? God challenges you. But there is something about us being honest. Where are we in our discipleship walk? Just to know that God just wants us to move forward, to step forward. That's all he wants. doesn't matter where we are, we can all move forward. We can all grow in our relationship with him. So I've just got a few questions here, just a couple to consider. And um, just right now, what is your approach to discipleship? Are you like Peter? Are you radically pursuing him? Are you giving Jesus your priority and those who are discipling you? Are you there? Is there a bit more of a measured commitment? A bit of holding back? Do you just fit it into a busy life when you can? You know, we all have busy lives. When I was talking about Peter prioritising, I wasn't suggesting for one moment you'll give up your jobs. And, you know, we know the realities of life. But is there a priority there? Or are we just fitting it into a busy life when we can? Are we even reluctant? Is it just not happening? Is it just not happening? But wherever we are, there's room to move forward. Okay? And are we seeking information or transformation? Do we understand that growing with Jesus is about transforming in our lives to become more like him? Leaving some things behind, but gaining other things. And as one who disciples, and we should all be discipling at some level or another, that's what we're called to do. Is our approach one of humility, honour, honesty? Is it like me? A sense of trying to fix others. We can bring all these things to Jesus. You know, he knows us anyway. <laughs> he knows what goes on. He's not going to be shocked. But, and he wants to help us. He wants us to move and grow in our discipleship. He didn't come to condemn. He came to save us.